Hi, this is Dave Wilkin. I just wanted to take a quick moment before I begin the uh, presentation uh, to explain what exactly it is that I'm doing here. This is uh, me practicing for a presentation at the North Carolina Trombone Festival at Appalachian State, which is going to be held on Saturday, April 13th, 2024. And so I have uh, recorded myself practicing through the slideshow. Uh, and figured that it would be a good opportunity to uh, share this information with a wider audience by posting it on YouTube. So thank you for watching, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for coming. Um, my name is Dave Wilkin. I teach jazz and trombone at Brevard College. I'm also the program director for Music Works Asheville, an El Sistema program that teaches life skills through music to elementary school children in Buncombe County Schools. And when I'm not doing that, I work as a freelance musician around Western North Carolina. My interest in brass embouchures happened when I was 27 in 1997. Uh, I was a graduate student at Ball State University, and I happened to catch a lesson from a trombonist named Doug Elliott. Some of you may be familiar with Doug's name because he played for a few years with the Airmen of Note. Some of you may be familiar with Doug Elliott's mouthpieces. He makes excellent custom low brass mouthpieces. Uh, but he also happens to be an expert on brass embouchure technique, and he was able to help me with my own chops, and uh, this sparked an interest in learning more about uh, how brass embouchure technique works and how to best teach it. I ended up writing my dissertation on the topic, which was uh, completed in 2000. And the photographs we're going to be seeing this morning uh, come from that particular study. We're going to be also watching some videos. And most of the videos that we'll watch come from a presentation I gave in 2010 to the North Carolina Music Educators Association. So let's go ahead and jump on in and get started by looking at the embouchure of a tubist. So many of the examples that I'll be showing you today use a transparent mouthpiece, which is interesting because you can actually get a, a quick look at what is going on inside the mouthpiece with the lips. So we're gonna look at this tubist and I'm gonna go off and start off and tell you that he has an embouchure issue that is holding back his playing. And let's see if by watching him, you are able to identify what's going on. <laughs> So I'm not going to actually tell you what's going on just yet. Let's take a look at another brass musician. This is a trumpet player who has uh, also has an embouchure issue, but this is a different uh, type of issue. And let's watch this video and see if you are able to tell what is going on with this player and what we need to correct. <laughs> Thank you. 
So in order for us to figure out what is going on with um, brass players who are having embouchure issues, the first thing that we need to understand is what is correct. And I'm going to start off and I'm just going to kind of gloss over three things that uh, many of you already know about. And uh, by and large, most successful brass players have these particular characteristics of embouchure form. First of all, we see an overall firmness in the area at and just under the mouth corners. So we don't want the mouth corners collapsing when uh, the player descends. We don't want them being pulled back into a smile when the player ascends. They should more or less remain fixed in place, uh, regardless of the register being played. Uh, the chin and jaw will function as a single unit. In other words, the chin doesn't bunch up and push up against the lower lip in order to ascend. And we want to be placing our mouthpiece consistently in the same place and not changing our mouthpiece placement according to what register we're being played on or that we're playing in. Um, so again, by and large, this is not very controversial and you can get many books and different resources on embouchure development that have exercises that are designed to help with this. But all that said, we can see some really excellent players that have very strange looking embouchures. So what's going on here? So we have to first of all understand that since everybody has a different face, everyone's going to have a different embouchure. And we're going to be looking at some examples of some players who are doing things one way and other players who do things the exact opposite way. And again, this is going to come down to the player's anatomy. We can't choose how to play. We have to work with our anatomy in order to have very efficient embouchure technique. And this is a little bit different from the way many teachers uh, actually instruct their students. Uh, so a lot of people just assume that works best for them must be the correct method. And some things like what I just mentioned before uh, concerning embouchure form and keeping the mouth corners in place, etc., those are pretty much good across the board. But uh, other things are different for different players. So we're going to take a look very closely at embouchure technique for the rest of this presentation, and we're going to try to approach it objectively, looking at the specific embouchure characteristics that can be different for different players. First thing what we're going to be talking about is airstream direction. So airstream direction, if you're not already familiar with it, it refers to how the air is blown past the lips and into the mouthpiece. And so if you think of it, we can have um, two or three basic categories of airstream direction. So the airstream can be directed straight into the throat of the mouthpiece. The airstream could be directed downward. The airstream could be directed upward and uh, the question to consider then is what is correct and how does somebody actually direct the airstream into the mouthpiece in a particular way anyway. So let's actually take a look at some different ways that players do this. And we're going to start off with a downstream example. So this is a, uh, an embouchure that if you look at the photograph here, notice that there is much more upper lip inside the mouthpiece. So this makes it an easy example to see. Because of the predominance of the upper lip, that upper lip uh, is going to slightly overlap the lower lip and the airstream gets blown down below the mouthpiece shank. And one thing that we'll see in a minute here is that the higher the pitch, the sharper that downward angle of the air gets blown. The lower the pitch, the closer towards blowing the air towards the shank of the mouthpiece. So let's take a look at this. We're going to look at a film put together by Lloyd Leno, who was a trombone teacher in Washington State. Uh, and he put this film together, I think sometime around 1980, where he video recorded, or filmed rather, using high-speed photography, a number of different trombonists playing into transparent mouthpieces. And you can see what the lips are doing vibrating in slow motion. So let's take a look at his introduction to the downstream embouchure types. So that slur we're just hearing now is what we are examples seeing. represent what I believe is the most common type of embouchure, the downstream. And right there is the change Notice to the, the F. The narration's a little bit off. Of the upper lip over the lower. This, as we shall see, is characteristic of the downstream type. Watch for the movement causing the change of pitch. 
And there's Beginning the switch to the B low flat, B flat there. The pitch now drops to F. Then, after sustaining the F, a larger change to the low B flat. The change of pitch is marked not only by slower vibration, but also by larger aperture in the lips. Now notice the in and out, down and up motion of the lips, and that there is more upper than lower lip in the mouthpiece. Now let's contrast that with uh, something that could be considered almost upside down of that, the upstream embouchure. Uh, the upstream embouchure places the mouthpiece with more lower lip inside the mouthpiece. And at this point, it might be useful to point out that uh, the airstream direction is not dependent on the horn angle. So we can see that both of the players in this slide and the, uh, the slide previous where I introduced the downstream embouchures, both of them have horn angles that are close to straight out. Uh, but because of the predominance of the lower lip inside of the mouthpiece, the air is going to get blown up above the mouthpiece shank. And similarly, the higher the pitch, the sharper that upstream angle gets played, and then the lower pitch, the more the airstream gets aimed towards the shank, but it never really tends to go quite, quite down the shank of the mouthpiece. So let's take a look at Lloyd Leno's film and, and take a, a look at the clip of uh, the introduction of the downstream embouchure types, or upstream rather. <laughs> And so that's the slur that we're going to hear here. Our next section or see here. deals with players who have upstream embouchures. Notice that the lip relationships are the reverse of the downstream types. That is, low mouthpiece placement, more lower lip movement, and of course the airstream is directed above the mouthpiece throat. The higher the pitch, the higher the airstream is projected. In the front view, it is particularly obvious that the aperture is off-center. Notice that during the lower pitches, the upper lip is quite active and that this decreases as the pitch ascends. So since the slur is descending, I'm not sure why he described it uh, in that way, but as the uh, player slurs down, if you look the upper lip which is not very active on the higher pitches, becomes much more active. So we talked downstream, we talked upstream. What about straight stream? So if the mouthpiece placement is what determines the airstream direction, so higher placement means more upper lip inside, that means the player is blowing down, less upper lip, more lower lip uh, directs the airstream up. What about 50-50 placement? So I've uh, uh, blocked out the view of the lips so we can't see what's going on inside the mouthpiece in these photographs without looking inside what's your guess as to how the airstream is being blown here is it up down or straight into the shank of the mouthpiece what do you think well in this case even though both of these players have roughly 50 50 placement one lip or another ends up predominating and the airstream is going to be directed either up as in the bottom photograph, or down, as in the top photograph. And uh, while many players will tell, tell you that they're blowing straight into the shank of the mouthpiece, and it can really some, help some players to actually visualize and, and feel like they're doing that, um, but they're probably not actually blowing straight in the mouthpiece. And I'm going to come back to blowing straight down the shank of the mouthpiece in a little while here. So just to summarize, airstream direction, it's not related to the horn angle, it's related to the mouthpiece placement. 
So a placement with more upper lip inside, like the top photograph, the upper lip predominates and the airstream gets blown down. More lower lip inside is upstream. Uh, downstream embouchures are more common. Upstream embouchures are less common. But again, that has to do with the physical anatomy of the player and is not a choice that players should be making uh, based on something arbitrary. Uh, also notice in these two photographs, both of these players happen to have horn angles that are tilted down with a slightly receded jaw. So again, we, we can see downstream and upstream players with a horn angle close to straight out, and we can see same players with horn angles tilted down. So let's go on and, and play another game. This is Guess the Pitch. Again, I've blocked out the view of the inside of the transparent mouthpieces, so we can't use the uh, lips inside the mouthpiece as a clue for this. But uh, one of the pitches that this player is playing is the F above high B flat, and the other pitch is low B flat. So just by looking at what's going on here, can you guess which, uh, which of the photographs is him playing the high B flat? or which of the pitches is playing the low, photos is him playing the low B flat. Uh, keep in mind, these two pitches are two octaves and a perfect fifth away, so it's a pretty wide interval. So the F above high B flat is uh, the top photograph, and the low B flat is the bottom photograph. And you can kind of see, on, especially on the bottom photograph that I captured the aperture in that photo uh, at, its, uh, at a pretty close to most open position. So that's uh, a clue that you could use if you could see inside the mouthpiece. Uh, inside of the mouthpiece is interesting, uh, but I'm uh, interested in pointing out something here that happens outside of the mouthpiece. And it might be tempting for you to look uh, at the uh, mouth corners or focus on how the red of the lips are positioned. But instead, what I want you to look at is the kind of north and south of the mouthpiece. And in particular, look at the distance between the mouthpiece rim and the nose between the two pitches. On the top photograph, the higher pitch, it looks like there's a little bit more distance uh, between the nose and the top of the mouthpiece rim. And on the lower photograph, the lower pitch, it's a little bit closer to the nose. And I want to point out that this player isn't resetting the mouthpiece to a different position on the lips. Kind of look and, and you can see there's this little bulge of flesh that's kind of being pushed up as uh, the player is playing the low note. So what's actually happening is a phenomenon that, for lack of a better term, I'm just going to be referring to as an embouchure motion this morning. Let's take a look at some videos of this so you can see it happening. I'm going to show you two different trumpet players, and both these players are doing things uh, in different ways again. So both of these players happen to be downstream embouchures. They both happen to have more upper lip inside the mouthpiece. But let's take a look at this trumpet player first. And notice that while he ascends... He pushes his mouthpiece and lips up, and then to descend, he pulls everything back down again. Now the second player, it's not quite as pronounced, but it's exactly opposite. You can see him pulling down to ascend, and he pushes up to descend. So again, we're, I'm just going to refer to this as an embouchure motion here, and just to make sure that we're all on the same page, what I'm referring to here is the mouthpiece and lips together, pushing up and down along the teeth and gums behind them. And this happens in a generally up and down type of uh, direction, but there's almost always a little bit of left-right motion that goes on as well. So in the hypothetical example here that I've got here, this player might push up to ascend, but also slightly to our right, and then pulling down and to our left to descend. But notice that it kind of travels in a straight line. And also I'm trying to demonstrate here that the distance between the octaves is about the same, just in the opposite direction. So if the black circle is middle B flat, that player might push uh, distance X to ascend to high B flat, but pull down the same distance to descend. And another thing to point out about this is that as we are making this motion, the horn angles can change to follow the shape and the teeth and gums underneath. Not just up and down, but also left and right. 
And we're going to see that in some cases, fine tuning this and making it work more efficiently can really make some big differences for the players. So using those two features, the embouchure motion, pushing up and down to ascend, and the player's airstream direction, that is how much upper or lower lip is placed inside the mouthpiece, we're going to be able to classify all embouchures into three basic types. The first type is downstream. This is the type that pushes up to ascend. There's also a downstream type that pulls down to ascend. And then there's the upstream type that pulls down to ascend. Now you will find uh, other brass teachers that use more detailed designations, uh, but these three basic types are more than enough to help troubleshoot and diagnose most embouchure difficulties. So let's start off and talk about what I think is the most common of the three basic embouchure types. That's the very high placement embouchure type. And it's just a nickname here, so don't, uh, don't get too wrapped up in that the placement needs to be like this trombonist, which is quite high and close to the nose. The main distinguishing factor for this is, uh, two distinguishing factors, is that there's more upper lip inside of the mouthpiece, and very commonly a lot, which is why I call it the very high placement type, but the embouchure motion is always pushing up to ascend and pulling down to descend. Players belonging to this embouchure type uh, almost always will align the teeth and have the horn angle straight out, although there are some exceptions. And another common characteristic is that the tone for these players is often naturally clear and bright, and often these players find their upper register as a strength, uh, but they might have difficulty descending correctly. Some examples of some famous players that you might uh, be familiar with that belong to the very high placement type include John Marcellus, Joe Alessi, Bill Watrous, and Conrad Herwig. Let's take a look at some videos of the various high placement embouchure types. Again, I think this is the most common of the three basic types, so I've got a lot of different examples to share. We'll start off with this trombonist here. <laughs> So we can see that the mouthpiece placement has more upper lip inside. It's uh, fairly high, fairly close to the nose. And also notice that as this player ascends and descends, he makes that embouchure motion of pushing up to ascend and pulling down to descend. And we can also kind of see that each note has a specific spot kind of along this track of that imaginary line of the embouchure motion. placement horn players are pretty easy to find. You can see uh, his airstream direction pretty clearly in this uh, shot here. His upper lip is predominating. And you can also see him pushing up to ascend and pulling down to descend. From the front view, it's particularly obvious that his embouchure motion has that angular deviation, so he's pushing up into his right to ascend 
and he pulls down into his left to descend. Uh, one thing that I also want to point out about this particular player, he's resting the bell of the horn on his leg. And so he's not able to really make horn angle changes to follow the shape of his teeth and gums as he's doing that. And we would expect that there would be some horn angle changes as one is doing that. Uh, speaking of that, tubists also make the embouchure motion, but they're going to have to kind of adjust the instrument and position of their body together to affect the embouchure motion. This is a very high placement tubist. One thing that I would point out with this tuba, the tubist, is the way he collapses his amateur formation to descend. Look at his mouth corner. Every time he descends, it kind of falls out, and then he has to bring it back into place. And he would probably do a lot better if he could develop the ability to descend with uh, keeping the mouth corners locked in place and then allowing the embouchure motion to help him become more secure in the low register. The next embouchure type that I'll discuss is also fairly common, but I don't think it's quite as common as the very high placement embouchure type. This type is also downstream, but they tend to place the mouthpiece with a little bit less upper lip than the very high placement type. So I'm gonna nickname this this morning the medium high placement type. Uh, the main distinguishing characteristic between the very high placement type and the uh, medium high placement type is the embouchure motion. The medium high placement types always pull down to ascend and push up to descend opposite of the very high placement type. It's pretty common for players belonging to this embouchure type to have their lower jaw slightly receded and then the horn angle is tilted down. But again, exceptions do exist. Players belonging to this embouchure type often find that they can have an easy time with having a dark and rich tone and lip flexibility is also uh, tends to be easy to develop. Uh, but these players can have a tendency of sometimes playing with their embouchure formations too loose in general and because of that need to work a little bit harder to develop their upper register. Uh, some famous examples of trombonists that you might be familiar with that belong to the medium high placement embouchure type include Jay Friedman, Christian Lindbergh, and J.J. Johnson. So let's took a, take a look at some videos of medium high placement embouchures. Um, just the luck of the draw uh, when I was collecting videos for my 2010 presentation that I mentioned earlier, all these particular players happen to be uh, trumpet players but we'll get the general idea by watching them. Same thing happens with trombone players as well. So a couple things to point out quickly with this trumpet player. And you can see that there's more upper lip inside, so it's a downstream embouchure. And we can also clearly see him pulling down to ascend and pushing up to descend. And also his jaw position is slightly receded, and so his horn angle is a little bit lower. And just as an aside from the front view, look at the position of his right corner, so the, the corner, mouth corner on the left, especially as he gets up high. It's a little bit weaker than the other mouth corner. And uh, that is because about a year earlier, this trumpet player had gone through about a Bell's palsy, which is a viral infection that paralyzes uh, one side of the face. And so he was still kind of recovering a little bit. You can kind of see the uh, mouth corner on our left side, his right mouth corner, is a little bit blown out compared to the other one. Now here's another really excellent uh, medium high placement trumpet player. You can see that there's more lower, uh, upper lip rather inside, and so the airstream is getting blown down, and his amateur motion is to pull down and to his left side a little bit to ascend, pushing up into his right side to descend. I also like showing this particular example because he's got very good embouchure form. So if you look at the position of his mouth corners, his mouth corners pretty much stay in place the whole time. He keeps the mouthpiece pressure more or less consistent the whole time. strong upper register, so you can see how keeping the embouchure formation firmed enough can really help.
Here's the same player from the side. Here's a less experienced medium-high placement trumpet player. And uh, notice her uh, overall embouchure form. You can see what I mean by uh, it being held a little bit too loose in general if we compare that to the player we just saw before her. And then the third of the three basic embouchure types is the least common of the three embouchure types, and we'll nickname this the low placement embouchure type. This is the only upstream type of the three basic types, so they place the mouthpiece with more lower lip inside, and often quite a bit more lower lip inside, like this particular uh, trombonist that I have up here. The embouchure motion for this particular type is to pull down to ascend and push up to descend. Most players belonging to the low placement embouchure type will align their teeth and play with a horn angle close to straight out, but again, exceptions do exist. Uh, upstream low placement type players often find their upper register is a strength, but they may need to work a little bit harder on developing a clear tone. And when everything is working well for these players, uh, everything can feel real easy for them. But when things are a little bit off, it can become very noticeable. And I am speaking from personal, uh, personal uh, experience here as a low placement embouchure type. Some famous examples of the low placement embouchure type that you may be familiar with, uh, jazz trombonist Kay Winding uh, and Rob McConnell, a valve trombonist uh, from Canada uh, who led the, a big band called the Boss Brass. Dick Nash, who was a studio player in Los Angeles for years and years. Uh, Rusty McKinney, who played bass trombone with the Utah Symphony. A uh, Cuban jazz player named J.P. Torres. And Larry Weehy, who soloed with the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy bands. So even though this is a less common embouchure type, we can still find many, many strong players belonging to this embouchure type. So let's take a look at some video clips of this embouchure type. This uh, first player is a trumpet player. You can see his extremely low placement, and his embouchure motion is also very clear, pulling down to ascend, pushing up to descend. Cool. And we can also hear that uh, as a low placement type, he uh, fits the common pattern of having a very strong upper register. his mouthpiece rim directly on the red of his upper lip. Again, there's muscular tissue underneath. There's no inherent reason why this won't work for a player as long as it fits their anatomy. Most players aren't going to play quite so well. Here's another upstream trumpet player. His placement's just a little bit higher, but you can still see that there's plenty of lower lip inside the mouthpiece. And you can also see that as he slurs up, he's pulling his mouthpiece and lips together down. And when he slurs down, he pushes them back up again. but it is still quite low. Here is an upstream tubist. You can see the predominance of the lower lip inside the mouthpiece, but notice the mouthpiece placement's not as low as the other examples. And this is a pretty common issue with a lot of low placement type players, that they don't place the mouthpiece actually low enough. And in a moment here, we're gonna see as he goes up into the upper register, he feels like he's working a little bit hard, and notice he'll reset the mouthpiece so that it's a little bit lower. Now watch here. 
resets the mouthpiece, it gets it a little bit lower. And uh, you might also notice then that when he did that, that the tone got a little bit clearer. Here is an upstream horn player. And again, notice the low placement, a lot more lower lip inside, very little upper lip. Also notice that she pulls down to ascend and pushes up to descend. common for some reason with low placement embouchure types. Notice her mouth corners and as she ascends, she, she pulls them back into what sometimes gets called the, the smile embouchure. Um, that is definitely worth correcting. We want to keep the mouth corners consistently firmed in the uh, same place for pretty much the entire register. Uh, pulling the mouth corners back like that stretches the lips a little bit and makes it more prone and sensitive to mouthpiece pressure. So once again, just to kind of summarize, the three basic embouchure types. We have uh, the very high placement embouchure type. That is a downstream embouchure. These players push up to ascend. Medium high placement embouchure type is also downstream, and they but they pull down to ascend. And then low placement embouchure type, upstream, pulling down to ascend. So now that we know about these three basic embouchure types, let's go back to the videos that we started off with this morning. So now that you're a little bit more experienced with the various brass embouchure types, you're gonna be able to start seeing and hearing some characteristics that happen when things aren't working well. And uh, if you get really practiced at this, you can sometimes see things before the problems even begin to manifest and become observable to the player himself or herself. So making a correction to a, an embouchure is a matter of figuring out what they should be doing and guiding that player towards their correct embouchure form and embouchure type. And of course, this is much easier said than done, but uh, now let's take a look again at this tuba player that we started off with and see with your additional background if you can tell what is going on with this tubist. <laughs> So let's look at his lip position and figure out whether he's, uh, which of the embouchure types he might belong to. And if you're looking closely, you'll see that in his low register he plays upstream, his lower lip predominates. When he goes into his upper register, his lips flip position and the upper lip predominates and he switches to downstream. And there's also a break point where he's doing that flip. Listen for the, the tone every time he gets there. And what tends to happen when he gets there is that the lips fight for predominance and the note cracks just a little bit. So earlier I mentioned 50-50 mouthpiece placement and how blowing straight into the shank of the mouthpiece uh, can be problematic. And so using this tubist as an example, let me show you one of the things that can happen when a player is literally blowing straight into the shank of the mouthpiece. So I asked him to play some slurs starting on and uh, then moving back to this uh, particular break point in his range where his lips are fighting for predominance and it's not going to be necessarily upstream or downstream. Notice what happens. <laughs> So 
That is one good indication that blowing straight into the shank of the mouthpiece is probably not a good idea, even if it feels like a player might be doing that. Uh, if they're a successful player, they probably aren't. So figuring out what this player needs to do is a matter of figuring out which airstream direction is going to work best for him. Is he going to settle in as an upstream player for his entire range or a downstream player for his entire range? Um, before I even ask him to do some experimenting with that, which is what I would have done with him, as I was just recording some video footage, I asked him a question to see uh, if he could do something and uh, notice his response. <laughs> doing something different with your embouchure. Yeah. Um, let's notice what he does. He had discovered this on his own. Actually, hold on, hold on a second, please. There we go. Now, um, let me see you try to hit that E on the other embouchure setting. Listen for the tone. And the intonation is a little bit flat. Not okay, as good. Which feels like more effort to you to play. The second, of course. Okay. But, um, my teacher of the past mm -hmm. told me that I should just keep practicing it that way mm -hmm. and I would build up a, mm -hmm. the strength required. Right. A lot of, um... So getting him to play with the lower yeah, mouthpiece placement for his entire range completely eliminates that airstream flip. And even though there's an initial lack of control in the registers where he's used to playing downstream, uh, that's that's looking real um, good though. With a little bit of practice, he can really develop this embouchure yeah, to work over his entire range. He'll be able to access those higher notes without having to reset his mouthpiece, and he won't have that break in the middle of his range. Um, so again, this player is an example of uh, a student who had been taught by a, a teacher who just assumed what worked for him was what was correct and didn't acknowledge that this particular player had a different anatomy and required a different approach to his embouchure technique. And then let's take a look at this trumpet player. And if you recall, I said that this trumpet player had a different embouchure pro pro issue going on than the tubist did. So take a look at him and again, see if you can tell what embouchure type he is. So there is more upper lip inside the mouthpiece. This is a downstream player. But look at the direction of his embouchure motion, and can you tell, is he pushing up to ascend and pulling down to descend, or the reverse? pulls down to ascend to the low B flat. So he's got an inconsistent embouchure motion. And this is a different kind of type switching than the tubist okay. was doing. He is type switching between the medium high and the very high placement types. So in order to figure out what this player needed to be doing, I'm going to show you a, a, a short little montage of me having him try some different things to work out what his correct embouchure motion should be. Uh, as we're watching this, listen for the tone and the intonation on the different pitches to see what's going on. So the first thing I did is just ask him to make the slur without instructing any anything in particular. Just make a slur as you normally play it. And it's really kind of difficult to spot any embouchure motion at all at this point. So then I asked him to push up to ascend. Notice there's actually an improvement, pretty easy to hear improvement. The tone gets better and the intonation on the G is better. Let's uh, see what happens when he does the reverse, down to ascend. So 
So the tone on the G is a little bit pinched now, and it's, the pitch is a little bit flat as well. So we're starting to figure out at this point that maybe he should belong to the very high placement and push up to ascend. Let's test it again, but make the interval larger. Let's compare that to pulling down to ascend for that same interval. See what works better. And that's interesting because as he tried to do that, he almost automatically started to descend even though he wanted to play higher. And the pitch on that high C is definitely uh, flat. So let's fine tune it a little bit more by looking at his descending Amisher motion. I asked him to pull down into his left, and that works pretty well for him. What about pulling straight down to descend? Not quite so well. You can hear the tone gets pinched as he descends. Oh, and just to check, we're going to pull down into his right and see if that makes any difference either. Again, not as good as pulling down into his left side. So knowing that, we can say that pushing up into his right is probably what he needs to do to ascend. So these next few clips here are him experimenting with this and trying to capture the feel of it. Notice also that his horn angle now is coming down into his left to descend and up into his right to ascend. And so we worked on that a little bit in order to get him to uh, be able to follow the shape of his teeth and gums underneath. And the more he experiments with this... Oh, yeah. Does it help? Yeah, it's like, um, it's like I don't have near, near even half the strength to go up there. I don't know why, though. Feels... Okay, and then, uh, sorry for the out-of-focus. Here we go. Holy crap. Can... And at this point, he's really figuring it out and capturing it. There you that go. We found it. Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah you found this. So now what? Now that you've known all that, you've learned all this. What do you do? Um, some of you may be wondering, how do I tell what my embouchure type is? And I will just say, first of all, it's very hard to analyze your own embouchure. I still capture lessons from uh, my teacher, Doug, once in a while to have him help me out. Uh, even though I've been doing this for a while now, it's always good to get a help from a teacher who already knows this or a teacher that's willing to learn more about this. Get somebody who uh, wants to learn more and can take a look at your chops for you. How should you practice? Um, I would say uh, one thing at a time for a little bit every day. So once you know if there's an embouchure characteristic that you want to make a correction or fine tune, work on it a little bit every day and then make sure that you forget about it and go play some music. Over time, what we want is those good habits become the way we always play because that's what works. And is it maybe better to not think about all of this? And I would say to that often, and it really depends on what you need help with. If your chops are working pretty well right now and you don't need any kinds of adjustments, then it might be better just to ignore this and just be aware that these different types exist. Um, but it also depends on what you're doing and where you need to go. And that is going to be different for every player, just like everybody has a different embouchure. So again, seek the help of a teacher who is interested in this. So I see from the time that I am already a little bit over the time, so I don't really have time for questions, but I'm going to be hanging around the festival uh, for at least into the afternoon before I have to head back to Asheville. Uh, and I'll try to make myself available during the lunch hour. So if you're floating around the area here, uh, come find me and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have then. And uh, if you want me to make a guess of your embouchure type, bring your horn and I'll take a look. 
And lastly, if you are looking for more information about this, I do have a website where I post a lot of uh, different uh, top, uh, top, little different topics, but a lot of stuff on brass embouchures. And the most comprehensive resource that I have up there, I call Embouchure 101. So go to wilktone.com and click on that resource on the top of the page. Or if you want to just scan that QR code, that should take you directly to the website. So thank you very much. I appreciate you attending my workshop today, and I'm looking forward to meeting you uh, throughout the festival and getting a chance to hear you guys perform. Thanks.